symptoms can be confusing. To simplify it, I'm going to break them down into five types. Uh, the first are types that arise from uh, the brain and the effect the drug is having on the brain. Uh, the next are um, behavioral symptoms. Addicts tend to act in certain ways. If you act the way they act, it is likely you have what they have. There are symptoms arise because a conflict uh, exists between your behavior and your values. Uh, they clash. You are not acting as you have been taught. There are social consequences. They differ in type and intensity with individuals. Um, Dr. George Valiant, Harvard University psychiatry, studied symptom types in two groups, Harvard um, uh, graduates and Boston blue-collar workers. He noticed that they had different kinds of symptoms, that the Harvard graduate alcoholics did not have uh, serious job problems, but the Boston blue-collar workers did have serious job problems. I don't think it takes a, a genius to figure out why that might happen. Uh, Harvard graduates don't reprimand themselves. They're usually the boss and not somebody who is going to be reprimanded by the boss. And then there's health, there are health consequences, which again differ with individuals because, let's face it, human bodies are different. Some of us are terribly susceptible to certain diseases, others are not, and so we resist uh, certain diseases. So we're going to go through those in sort of just that way. Uh, the neuropsychological symptoms uh, indicate that the brain is adapting and becoming tolerant. If you think and feel and act like an addict, it may be that you are one. Uh, your values and your behavior clash. You have trouble managing your social roles as employee or spouse or parent or law-abiding citizen and it affects your body. So here are the neuropsychological symptoms. The first is never have a, a, a handy way of, of men talking about this symptom. I have a friend uh, who when you ask her uh, what her drug of choice is, uh, she would say, more. <laughs> In other words, didn't give a damn what it was as long as there were more of it. Okay. <laughs> so increased desire, increased need, increased use, more, 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 more. All right. The system responds to the drug by, in a sense, uh, needing the drug to replace what the drug has taken away. So this is crazy. Uh, the current metaphor being used to describe this is that uh, the drug, Jim Beam, replaces, takes the place of, gives you a shot of dopamine. The brain responds by saying, we're getting dopamine, we don't need to produce it. And so the only way you get dopamine, the feel-good chemical, is Jim Beam. And you use Jim Beam and it takes away dopamine, so how do you get dopamine? It's Jim Beam and round and round and round you go. So this is why, uh, this is why an addict will uh, uh, drink um, before he even goes to the party, because he's not sure there'll be enough at the party uh, to satisfy him. Tolerance. It, it um, either two ways, either it keeps taking more of the drug to produce the desired effect, or the same about produces decreasing uh, effect. It's not good luck, it's bad luck. If you're tolerant, that alone doesn't say you're an addict, but it does say that in order to get the pleasure from the drug, you almost have to start using it in harmful amounts. I, I know a professional uh, who told me quite frankly, he said, I, in college I was terribly tolerant. but I asked him about symptoms. He had no other symptom that I could detect. He said, I was just very tolerant. He said, my drinking now is minimal. I just don't do it very often, okay? And I just do it uh, as a social act, but I was, I was always fairly tolerant. The pattern of loss of control. 
unintended acute intoxication. You didn't mean it, but it happened, all right? Uh, over time, an addict is unable to predict consistently how much he will drink or drug, how much he'll drink for how long, and what will happen as a result. You know, how many times did you intend to throw up? Two. How many times did it happen? Fifteen. How many times did you want to pass out? None. How many times did it happen? Regularly on weekends <laughs> or whatever, all right? Um, that's, that's loss of control. If you end up feeling ashamed of your drinking, it's probably an indication that you have lost control. In fact, I always think guilt is a, an excellent measure of loss of control because if while you're drinking, uh, you feel guilty about your behavior as a result of your drinking, then it means to me two things. One, you may have lost control. Why? Because you didn't, you didn't mean to do things that you feel guilty about. Right? If you feel guilty, it means you didn't want to do it. If it happened anyway, then mm, maybe you've lost control. The other thing guilt tells me is you must be a fairly good person because you feel guilty. Uh, guilt tells me three things about you. Uh, one, you can tell the difference between right and wrong. Two, um, you are capable, uh, you are sensitive to the feelings of others. And three, you can admit that you've blown it, that you've made a mistake. Those are good people. I think we need more people who feel, who are capable of guilt. Because it says good things about them. You know right from wrong, you're sensitive to the feelings of other people, and you could be honest with yourself and admit that you've made a mistake, that you've blown it. I, there was a, I probably say this more often to, during these lectures uh, than I realize, but I, was, I learned a, about addiction from a woman who, uh, at one lecture I attended, she said this quote, and I wish I could claim it as my own. You know those, those things you hear other people say, and you say, damn, I wish I'd made that one up. She said, alcoholics are worth saving. They feel so guilty. And I thought, yeah, yeah, wow. That's profound. That was profound. Loss of control. An instance is an instance. A pattern of loss of control is a problem. Blackout. Not passing out. Uh, you, you are still appear to be conscious to other people. The problem is you can't remember what happened that evening. You remember going to the party. Uh, you remember getting there. You may even remember taking a drink and then bleep, it's gone. Memory has been blocked out somehow. I don't know exactly how that process works. I don't know if we'll ever know how that process works. But uh, it's not an, a, a usual response. Uh, it's an unusual uh, response. What you do with a blackout is important, whether or not you consider it ser serious or, oh, it's something that happens to everybody, uh, that can make a big difference in your ability to self-diagnose. Um, but it doesn't happen to everybody. And so if it happens to you, you better start wondering about, especially if this is a growing pattern, that you've got some pattern of loss and control, evidence of tolerance, more and more and more, blackouts, relief use. What that means is that you're using a social or recreational drug as if it were a prescription drug. So you're drinking alcohol as if it were an anti-anxiety agent, like a benzodiazepine. You're smoking pot uh, to relieve depression. I don't care what else you call that, that's not social use. In fact, the irony of much relief use is that you're using the drug to relieve a problem that was caused by using the drug. <laughs> and so you're in a terrible kind of circle there. You've gotten alcohol 
or benzos as the solution rather than the source of the problem. A Jekyll Hyde reaction. Uh, we'll talk about personality change later on. Jekyll Hyde means uh, is based on, you know, that that novel by uh, that guy. Uh, he must have known an alcoholic. It means that when under the influence, only then, there's a sudden and dramatic change in personality, usually in the violent direction. So you're a wonderful person. Unfortunately, when you get drunk, unpredictably, your personality switches. It's almost as if you took a potion that made you uh, a killer, okay, a murderer. Uh, in fact, some people have committed murders uh, when this uh, has been a, a symptom for that. Personality change is different. We'll talk about that later. But Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are a good a rendition of one of the symptoms of addiction. Emotional augmentation. Um, stress can be measured on a scale of zero to 10. Uh, if you are given a stress three situation, a, a normal human being who does not have a drug issue, whose brain is not agitated, will experience that as response three. If you give the same stressor to an addict, he will respond as if it were a stress seven situation. So he has an exaggerated emotional reaction uh, to uh, feelings, to um, stressors. Um, and that's, that's an issue too, that's a problem too. It, it does tend to go away in early recovery, but it looks terribly psychiatric in active addiction. Continued use despite problems. That it seems that your desire for the drug outweighs any problem that the drug has caused. So you can't remember, um, you know, having uh, cursed out your best friend. Uh, you just take a drink about it. Because the drug and its impact on you is more important than any problem that it may cause. At some point, we begin to wonder whether or not uh, the drug has replaced uh, another value. If you are presented with the option of drink or divorce, you choose drinking, then you've made a serious and significant life choice. Uh, that alcohol, the drug, whatever the drug, alcohol, marijuana, I don't care which, which drug we're talking about. Uh, that the drug is more important than a relationship. Wow, that's significant. We, we almost always hope that love will top booze. Sometimes it doesn't. Impaired short-term memory, but I just learned that a little while ago and so I can't remember why. <laughs> you can remember things that happened 15 years ago. You can't remember what you had for breakfast. 15 minutes ago, okay? Your short-term memory is impaired. If you're a student in school, when you most need your short-term memory, the ability to remember things that happened recently, uh, you're using marijuana during those times, it's just counterindicated. You, you're using a drug that impairs the very short-term memory that you need most of all at this time. That doesn't make sense to me. We had a patient who would tell us about a fishing hole that he frequented when he was 16 years old. This guy was 65. And he described the fishing hole where the beavers had built this little dam, blah, 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 blah. If I asked him what he had for breakfast 10 minutes ago, he couldn't tell me. He'd have to make it up. He'd have to pretend that he remembered what he had for breakfast 10 minutes ago. Impaired short-term memory. Long-term memory may be in intact but short-term memory is impaired. For males, impotence, and for me females, a decreased interest in sex. So, in fact, the drug, uh, drink enough of it, it can uh, damage a part of your brain that causes you to be either temporarily impotent or permanently 
uh, impotent. So we know it's the drug that's causing the problem because if you're drinking, you don't have an erection. When you stop, because you're so sad that you can't have an erection, you have an erection. You're so delighted you've had a re, uh, uh, an erection that you, you drink to celebrate the erection and of course then the erection goes away and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what makes that thing go up and down. It's booze. So could impotence become a permanent problem? Yeah, you can damage enough of your brain so that it becomes more than just a temporary, reversible problem. Addicts get suspicious and paranoid. Pot is a great producer of paranoid kinds of thinking. All right? You think somebody's going to get you. I knew a young woman uh, who, while she was in college, uh, had paranoid feelings that were so intense that between classes, that 10 minute break, she would hide out in the bathroom because she was convinced that somebody was after her. Suicidal behavior. Um, in early addiction, sometimes only when you're drinking, so you're not suicidal at other times, but when you're drinking, you start thinking about Maybe it would be better if I would do myself in. It is a depressant drug, after all. Okay. Uh, in late-stage addiction, you could have suffered so many losses, so much damage, so much shame, that you're suicidal even when you're not drinking. Now you've lost your family, your job, and your self-respect. Life is depressing, and you start thinking uh, it's not worth it anymore. And some people then attempt or su succeed. Clinical withdrawal are all explained. Different for different drugs. You can have the shakes, for instance, because you've been drinking a depressant or using a depressant drug and you stopped it suddenly. And so you got the shakes. The brain has responded to the downer, downer, downer by trying to counteract it with upper, 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 you took the downer away too quickly and you started to shake. What would solve that, the shakes? There's another drink. <laughs> because we have to balance the system again. You can also get the shakes because you've been smoking too much cocaine, snorting too much coke, all right, using too much crack, using um, a ton of amphetamines because that's a stimulant drug and it could produce the shakes. Same thing could be true with um, hallucinations. Y you can hallucinate because you've been using an hallucinogen. So it's the primary effect of the hallucinogen to get you seeing stuff that ain't there. It's not there. Uh, you use LSD and you know flowers will sing. Uh, numbers will dance. There's all kind of crazy shit that happens to people uh, when they're using lysergic acid diethylamide. You can also hallucinate if you've been using too much alcohol and stop abruptly and you start hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, um, talking to people who have been dead, etc., etc. Convulsions. Um, you have been using a depressant drug, you stopped it abruptly, and you have a convulsion. It looks like a, an epileptic seizure. You had a man have one in that third row, third chair, one night when I was doing another lecture. I had a seizure. I started to um, make that characteristic sound that you hear. It's, um, it's from uh, too much, uh, I mean, too little downer drug in a system that's dependent on downer drug. You just took it away too quickly. You need to consult with people who understand uh, dependence, withdrawal, uh, and detoxification if you're wondering about your, whether or not you run that risk. You can also have a convulsion if you're doing too much cocaine. Okay, So it's uh, not enough downer or too much an upper will produce the same s symptom. And with alcohol, and alcohol only, the most serious of all the 
withdrawal symptoms is delirium tremens. That's what DTs mean. D DTs means, and this doesn't happen with any other drugs, alcohol. Uh, you are delirious. In other words, you're not oriented to time, place, or person. You don't know who you are, where you are, or when you are. <laughs> All right? And um, you're trembling. You might also have an hallucination. But this is a serious medical condition, in fact, life-threatening. This, uh, this is the one withdrawal symptom that can kill you. DTs, delirium tremens. The others will make you wish that you were dead, but they won't kill you. This one can do the trick. Um, so when we talk about uh, w how serious is a drug, you know, alcohol is, is uh, the drug that if you have DTs, has the potential to do you in. So those are the brain symptoms. The next are how do addicts act? If we took a 1,000 alcoholics and other dr drug addicts and we asked them this question, when you were actively using, what did you think, feel, and do? All right? They would give us a list of those behaviors. And we could match your behavior to their behaviors and use that as a set of indications that you might have this disease. Denial and rationalizations. I think we've talked enough about that already. You know, the problem is if you deny you have an addiction, it's one of the signs that you probably do. All right. If, of course, there's evidence that you do. Defense mechanisms. All kinds. Um, I'm a good person. Uh, I drink like everybody else. We've gone over some of those before. You get touchy about your use, you know? Uh, you ask a social drinker, how much do you drink Friday? And you know what he'll do? He'll tell you. Why? It's no big deal. You can ask a, a, an alcoholic how much you drink Friday. He might answer by saying, none of your goddamn business. Ooh, touchy. Why would you be so sensitive uh, to a simple question uh, like that unless somehow you have had experiences that make that question feel shame-provoking? Anxiety. You can be anxious because you drink too much alcohol. You could be anxious about uh, fearing that your denial system is going to collapse and you're going to get found out. Depression. Depression's a tough one. Uh, you can manifest the signs of depression just as a result of using depressant drugs. So alcohol, for instance. Uh, here are some signs of depression. You've lost your appetite because it irritates your stomach. Your, your sleep patterns are disturbed. You're not sleeping very well. Sign two of depression. You feel sad, blue, and down. It is a depressant drug. You have been thinking of suicide, another of the symptoms of depression. Okay? And you're impotent. Jesus, it sounds like you have a depression. Right? And if you don't say to a psychiatrist, let me tell you how much drinking I've been doing, you'll probably get an antidepressant. If you do tell him how much drinking you're doing, he might say, this could all be as a result of your drinking. So there's one way to get depressed. The other way to get depressed, and that's why it's difficult to put it in uh, the behavioral category or the neurobiological uh, category, the other way to get de depressed is because you lost your family, your job, and your self-respect. And it's depressing. So, depression can fit in a bunch of places. Loss of confidence and loss of self-esteem. Sometimes hidden, sometimes what you see is a brave face. What you don't see is how much damage, self-esteem, loss of confidence, and shame are, are going on beneath that surface. Okay. Uh, one of the best instances in which um, you'd be better off believing that drinking uh, is the cause of low self-esteem and loss of confidence than that loss of confidence and self-esteem causes heavy drinking. The best example I, I can think of is Mickey Mantle. You guys are going to know how old I am fairly soon. How many of you remember Mickey Mantle? Boy, he hit a baseball further than any other human being on the face of the earth. 
in the 50s, by the time he was 61, dying of liver cancer, uh, he had lost all the self-esteem that he had had as a young man. Control ploys. An addict at some point begins to recognize that, you know, I am, there are times when I am getting drunker than I meant to be. I'd better try some tricks to drink, but not get drunk. So they will. And there are, again, dozens of these ploys. Uh, drinking only uh, after 5 o'clock. Uh, switching to beer only. Uh, drinking only um, on the weekends. Uh, drinking only in bars. Drinking only at home. Uh, buying a fixed amount, only refrigerating three cans, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The funniest one I ever heard uh, was I read this in a woman's magazine. It said, dear ladies, if you're having trouble controlling your drinking, try this. Uh, go out and get yourself some poker chips. Take three poker chips because you've decided that this evening you will have three drinks. Okay? Put th three poker chips in your left-hand pocket. Every time you take a drink at the party, you will remove a poker chip from your left-hand pocket, and you'll put it into your right-hand pocket. When your left-hand pocket is empty, you have finished drinking for the evening. If you were at a party and you saw a woman doing this, what would you think? You'd at least say, what's going on with the poker chip stuff? And she'd say, well, I'm controlling my drinking. And you'd say, oh, do you have a problem? And she would say, no. <laughs> then what are you switching poker chips for if you haven't somehow needed some trick to keep you from doing something you're having difficulty doing? I mean, people have kept it in cars so that they have to go out to the car to get a drink. All right, they kept it in inconvenient places. There are tons of these measuring in a graded tumbler. Uh, I've seen so much of this, it just, after a while, it starts to get funny, if it weren't so sad. Now, personality change. You know, you can't use a uh, psychoactive drug, whether it be a stimulant or an hallucinogen uh, or a depressant, without somehow changing your personality your belief system. You've got to deny that the drug is a problem, and yet you're doing all kinds of things that you should be ashamed of, so you're going to have to incorporate all that uh, into your thinking. Drugs making you angry and pissy and, uh, and uh, full of resentment, and that's shaping your personality. You have a ton of unexpressed uh, uh, hidden shame, and that's just changing your personality. You can't you can't poison a man for 20 years and not change his personality. If you think you can do that, Jesus, I'd like to see someone give that a shot. I don't know of another name to call this except telephoneitis. An addict will get on the telephone late at night and call you. Have you ever gotten a call? Have, how many of you have gotten a call? Yeah, they want to tell you how much they love you. They want to tell you how much difficulty they're having now, okay? Uh, they want to dump guilt so that they don't feel it anymore. Uh, they get off the phone, they feel better, you feel like shit. Because you've kind of accepted all that crap. It works, and it works temporarily. They do kind of relieve themselves, or they connect. You know, addiction drives people uh, into isolation. And at some point, late at night, under the influence, they'll call you just to reconnect. Sometimes they'll call you and forget the next day that they have called you because they blacked out and made that call. It's a weird disease. Maturity. If you're 13 and you start on a pattern of alcoholism, uh, you'll hit 16 and 17 and you're uh, your maturity will be put on hold. If you drink then for the next 20 years, uh, you will be 33 going on 14. 
because you'll stop maturity. You'll arrest it. You'll put it on hold. Uh, I've seen cases like this. Some of them are so sad, you know, that the, the fellow is 50 years old and he's still acting like a, a teenager, okay? Uh, if you're an adult who's on set has been late, uh, you can even go backwards. So the more you drink, the more you start acting, not like your uh, stated age, but like a much younger age. So maturity gets played with in terrible sorts of ways. Uh, some people uh, rebound rapidly from that arrested growth. Uh, other people, it takes time just to deal with that, just to sort of grow up after you get sober. Resentment and self-pity are a part of the picture. When we meet next week, we'll talk more about that. Uh, but if you find that you're either feeling uh, resurrecting old anger from the past, reviewing it and renewing it, you're having a resentment. And that's quite usual in an addict, all right? It's not un unusual. Uh, in fact, next week we'll explain uh, the role it plays in addiction. It, it, it plays a dynamic role in addiction. As long as you can feel sorry for yourself and resent other people, you give yourself an excuse to keep on drinking. Mistrust of others. Why? Because when they ask you how you're doing, you smile and say, fine, you know that's a lie. And so all you have to do is project that onto others and when they smile, guess what you think they, that means? That they're bullshitting you too. So you, you lose trust in what you see on other faces because you know that what they see on your face isn't the truth. It's a deception. So they start not trusting uh, other people. When, when I educate counselors, I would always tell them, you might come in as the as the target for a lot of that mistrust. So get used to it. And then preoccupation, obsession uh, with the drug. It's a, it's a kind of growing, goes from I look forward to drinking, I'm preoccupied with drinking, I'm obsessed with drinking. Look forward means there are three things to do. You're gonna do all, thing, all three, but the first and most important one seems to be the drinking. Uh, preoccupied means there are three things to do this weekend and you have trouble fi figuring out what the other two are. <laughs> and obsessed means there aren't three things to do. There's only one and that's drinking. So these symptoms change over time. This is not a static process. It's a dynamic process. So symptom causes symptoms in this chain of symptoms. Then the signs of conflict. You felt guilt, shame, and remorse. You must be a good person. You have values. Or else you wouldn't feel guilty because you just don't give a shit whether or not you violate your, your values. And shame. You know, you, you cross your own boundaries. These aren't laws. These are your laws. And remorse just means to die again. The results are increasing alienation and isolation. Uh, you don't share uh, your insights with others. Um, you keep them to yourself. And you get to believe after a while uh, that no one on the face of this earth has done what you've done. And that drives you into further isolation. There are attempts to straighten out. Okay, There are attempts to Stop drinking even sometimes. An addict may in fact have periods of abstinence during which he remains abstinent and um, feels guilty of course, but uh, was able to stop for a while. Um, he may, you know, go to the gym, eat wheat germ, pray, read the Bible, etc. cetera. Um, he might search for cures, job cures, uh, um, location uh, uh, cures. Um, the addicts are famous for moving to another city, hoping that they'll get rid of the addiction by, by changing location. 
or changing wives or husbands uh, because it's the husband who is to blame or the wife who is to blame. Um, they may go to psychiatrist uh, hoping to find a psychological explanation for their primary disease. Social consequences, school problems, job problems, financial problems, legal problems, household problems, marital and relationship problems, all of those. Start young, you'll start with problems in school. Unless you're self-employed, uh, you are likely to have some job problems. Dr. Valiant noticed that Boston blue-collar workers had job problems, all right? They didn't have family problems. Hell, they were Boston blue-collar workers. And you know the Irish have these long-suffering wives who'll put up with anything. Um, financial problems. You can't practice an addiction to alcohol, throw in some marijuana, and do some cocaine. Just those three without... Uh, that your drug uh, expenditures don't get to be hefty after a while. And you better head pay them, too. Because uh, if you don't pay them, those dealers aren't in the business to uh, help you feel good. <laughs> I hope you know that. They're in the business to make money. If you don't pay them, they'll find some way to let you know that you should pay them. Legal problems. DWIs, uh, arrests for acute intoxication, uh, crimes committed as a result of loss of money, burnt food, marital problems, etc. All of these. Health problems. Either the direct or indirect health consequences. Uh, alcohol will damage your liver, your pancreas, your esophagus, your lungs, your brain. Um, Cirrhosis of the liver is a permanent, irreversible scarring of the liver. It's dead cells. Brain cell loss, when cells are dead, they never regenerate. The only instance we have of resurrection uh, was a long time ago. But brain cells, dead cells, never come back to life. Damaged cells may regenerate. If you get pancreatitis, um, you're likely to have a recurring uh, stabbing pain. Uh, feels like it goes through your back uh, and into your stomach, and it's chronic and recurring. So those are some of the direct consequences of excessive drinking. And then there are accidents and injuries, falls, auto accidents, and household accidents. When you're drunk, you know, you could put your hand in a, in a pot of boiling water and, and uh, not realize it until, you, you know, it does some serious damage. And then if nothing else, you, you neglect your health. It can get that bad. People who, years ago, where the pictures of health have now ignored, you know, their teeth, they've ignored uh, routine health care, and so they end up sicker and sicker and sicker. And that is the end.